welcome. This is a session on how economic headwinds fuel creativity. And I'm sure many of you in the audience, no matter where you work, agency side, client side, you run a business, you're an entrepreneur, you're probably wondering what's happening in the world. We're hearing about economic headwinds, we're hearing about um, increases in inflation, and then at the same time, we're also hearing about the job market being stable. And it's a confusing picture. But I'm joined by two incredible guests who can actually help us navigate some of those questions. Two people that have driven both entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity um, from leading marketing and communications all the way through to funding businesses and big ideas, as many of you will be aware. So please join me in welcoming my two guests, entrepreneur and Mr. Wonderful, uh, Kevin O'Leary. <laughs> And EVP of Marketing and Communications from MasterCard, Rustam Distur. Please welcome Rustam. Thank you. All right. Okay. So we're going to jump straight in. Um, if you can see, you can see on the screen here, there are, as I said, the, it's a confusing picture. The story is mixed. Um, for the last six months plus, we're hearing that this is the world's worst economy ever. Um, as I said, in the US, the job market seems stable. Um, if you're in marketing, you're on the P&Ls at cost center, you're probably the first thing that's being cut. If you're in an agency, your clients are telling you how can you optimize. Performance marketing has never been more important. Data drives every decision. What are you going to do about it? So the most important thing to remember is that innovation is at the heart of every crisis. And what comes out of a crisis and what comes through innovation are some of the best ideas. But let's kick it over to Kevin first to tell us about what's happening in the world and how you see this and how would you advise everyone in the room on how to think about this economic whirlwind that we're in? Well, I agree with the idea that it's perplexing because each recession, and I've lived through, and I've seen this movie many times before, has its own personality. This one's unique. It's very hard to contemplate a recession at full employment, yet that's what we have. In, in my portfolio of companies, private, all of them, um, about 56 of them. They're across all 11 sectors of the S&P in almost every geography in the U.S. We see the tear sheets uh, for revenue and cash flow on a very orderly basis, often once a week. Uh, we were, and here's the challenge for any small business right now. So full employment, we haven't seen a slowdown in consumer demand. I don't care what it is. Is it insecticide? Is it greeting cards? Is it commercial kitchens? Cupcakes, gym equipment, wireless charger? We have all that stuff. We haven't seen a slowdown yet. And at the same time, you're watching all this doom and gloom, and I see it too, and so do the CEOs of these companies, and their decision, the hard part of all this is what to do about inventory going into holiday and Q1. Do you pull back because you think this recession is going to hit us in Q4, which we're basically in right now, and holidays coming up in a few weeks, extended holiday this year by over three days, which if you're doing 200 million or 150 million in sales, a lot of inventory. And so you're trying to gauge the pessimism out there as the stock market tries to forecast the future in 2023. Meanwhile, your sales are humming. So do you want to leave anything on the table? And more of a perplexing situation coming out of the pandemic is most of these companies have gone past 50% direct to consumer models, big succulent margins, direct to consumer, bypassing retail, advertising digitally, acquiring customers economically, they know their CAC, they know their subscription services, they know the attrition rates, they're making money, and if they sell product online that they don't have to ship, well, you should burn in hell in perpetuity for that. And so, you know, that's basically the challenge this, that most small businesses have. There is no evidence of a recession yet, yet clearly the market is telling you it's coming. You just don't know when. Last speculation I'll make, the reason this is happening is we printed $6.7 trillion basically for free in 30 months, and then we say, oh, there's inflation. Well, no shit there's inflation, <laughs> because extra cash chasing fewer goods creates higher prices, which is what's happened. But all that cash is still sloshing around, which is why the consumer is not dead yet. That's my two cents on it. Awesome. Well, Rustam, you're looking at consumer spend data every day. Tell this us guy should know. Yeah, tell us what you're seeing. <laughs> Look, we, we look at, as a payments company, this is our lifeblood, so we look at consumer spend data very closely. For the month of September, we're still seeing data look very strong for consumer, send, consumer spend, retail data. 
online and traditional. It's not just strong relative to this year, it's strong relative to two years ago pre-pandemic. So there's a lot of pent-up demand that is bursting through into retail spend. The question is how long that pent-up demand lasts. Now, one of the things we hypothesize is that some of that is just because household savings were so high during the pandemic, and there's that sort of burst to get out, to spend, uh, to consume again. And as Kevin said, there's all this extra money floating around in the economy. But what we've got to be sort of a little bit conscious of is that that phenomenon may be coming to an end, mm. where especially at the lower end of the spectrum, that incremental household cash that existed might start drying up. And as we start going into the holidays and into next year, with lending also tightening and no fiscal help coming from the Fed for, for borrowers into next year, you might see some of this demand contract and uh, level off prices, prices and cool things down a little bit. So there is some sort of uh, belief that as we go into the fourth quarter and early next year, we might get a truer picture than what we're seeing today. I think it's really interesting. Um, we were just talking in the back about what we're seeing at Meta and for small businesses in particular. We just released our 10th state of small business report globally. Uh, similar trends, you know, businesses are not reopening at the rate that we would have expected. About 19% still remain closed in the United States and 20% globally. But what we are seeing in terms of positive trends are um, hiring. 74% of businesses told us that they are, they've hired a lot more in the last six months than ever before. And also the use of digital tools, you know, that continues to increase. And I was just saying to Kevin in the back that the trend we're seeing is women-owned businesses are actually leading the way in terms of their sales through digital versus men, which, you know, big it up for the women in the room. I think that's a really fantastic way to lead. But, you know, if you're walking into the C-suite and you're a marketer or a small business and you're looking for investment, what are you saying to CEOs and CFOs to convince them that this is a good place to spend money? Well, um, there has been a change in investor sentiment regarding investing in small business, and here's what it is. Because of what occurred during the pandemic, this remarkable digital pivot, I call it you know, America 2.0, where companies that pre-pandemic, if you look at the pie chart of revenue, it would have been 50% through retail, 40% through Amazon, just another retailer, except you don't get the data from them, 10% your own website. That's completely changed. The successful companies that went through the pandemic, even Amazon went to essential goods only, if you remember, in February, March, April, and May of 2020. So those companies had to build out their own platforms and start acquiring customers. So if you look for an A round or a B round or a C round in a, in a small business now, and you go to the investor community and say, look, I'm looking for money, the first question every investor's analyst asks you, and we're no different, do you know your CAC, your customer acquisition costs? Do you know your attrition rate of customers? Do you know the lifetime value of that customer? And are you now past 50% direct to consumer? Because when you get past 50% direct to consumer, you get something more valuable than anything. You get data, your own data, size, preference, flavor, frequency of purchase, price point, regional disparities on flavors and all kinds of sizes and differences in people's preference just like the wine business, for example, what people drink in Florida is completely different than what they drink in Ohio. And if you're selling direct, which you can to 42 states now, you have that data. And that data is priceless. It's the new oil. Data is the new oil. So if your company can't analyze data, you're not collecting data, you don't even understand what I'm talking about, no chance in hell you're getting an investment. You're just going to go out of business because your competitors are so much better than you. That's what's different in the last two years. Data. Companies that know how to mine data and understand it, because that's the first thing we ask. If you understand your CAC, I can pour four, five, six million dollars onto it and grow the business dramatically, because we already know I'm just pouring gasoline on the fire. If you don't know, we don't even read the deck. That's so interesting, it's about knowing your consumer. Tell us more, you're in a marketing position and yeah. data obviously is critical to how you think about it. Yeah, I mean, just building on the theme Kevin uh, led off with is that a small business today has to be a digital business. There is no option. And we see that in our data. Large digital businesses grow about three times as fast as small businesses online, simply because they're better set up to do so. And this is a societal problem. This is not just a small business problem. We cannot have small businesses fail because they're not digital businesses. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, it is that education, it is those tools, it is empowerment, uh, it is mentorship, it is 
enabling them to mine data the way Kevin's talking about. So they have a legitimate competitive proposition in the digital space. Now, what we also see is that when you are a service business, your digital proposition is a little stronger as a small business than a large business. So for example, tax accounting or uh, any small business that, uh, that affords or offers a service tends to do larger than a commoditized large business in the online space. So while data is important, taking that data and applying a service proposition around it is also incredibly important. Yeah, I actually think that's super interesting. You know, we, you think about the businesses that have built their business on Facebook or Instagram. When you think about Instagram, you often sort of quickly go to retail and fashion and cosmetics and, you know, things that you like to see in your feed. But it's actually the service industries, the accountants, the hair salons, right. the legal advisors that are actually doing phenomenally well by creating community and talking directly to their customers through our platforms. So let's talk a little bit about risk. Um, you know, again, how would you advise people in this room to think about in this world where everybody's feeling a little bit risk averse and buttoning down the hatches, what would you say is a reasonable risk to take? We'll start with you from a marketing perspective, would be great to hear. Sure. You know, I always cringe a little bit when we tie marketing with budgets. Uh, and I. I always get that, converse, that, that question, that how do you go and talk to your CFO about money? I don't want to talk to my CFO about money. I want to talk to him about opportunity. Uh, marketing is a competitive advantage for a business. And more important than money is ingenuity. And when the money tightens, the ingenuity has to grow even more. So what I'm looking for from my teams for the next year is not to worry all day and night about what the budget is, but it's what are you going to do with the money you have? How are you going to make it work harder? Because I think that's where the real magic happens, not just in the budget on its own. So when it comes to risk taking, there are many things we'll do differently next year than this year. If the, if the ability to spend contracts, which we expect it might, then we'll do more targeted work. We'll get better on segmentation. We'll talk uh, less to fewer people, but more effectively. We'll find loyalty and retention as a bigger objective than acquisition. So there's a lot you can do to manage these moments. But you've got to show ingenuity and not just depend on a budget and a check. I love that. That's really helpful. What do you think about that, Kevin? And you know, any advice that you would well, I, I take I take a slightly different approach because if if I look at a company and they're spending twelve to eighteen percent of their income statement on marketing, essentially, I want to know what the return of that is. And so, to me, that is measured by customer acquisition costs because I don't care who you are, what you sell. It's, it's as you said, Rustam, that it's about digital. I mean, it, every business is successful, even Nike, a giant behemoth, during the pandemic, they claimed it was going to take them six years to get to 50% direct consumer in all geographies. They did it in five months. And as a result, survived the pandemic at much higher margins and free cash flow because the only cost you have if you're direct to consumer is manufacturing, logistics of shipping, and customer acquisition costs. That's it. Now, if you have that situation, you're bypassing the traditional distribution, saving 40%, and that goes right back into the business. So for me, it's if you're spending money on marketing, are you constantly experimenting with new ideas? So I al I've always said to my companies, I want a third of marketing to be experimental every quarter. Because if you're just sitting on your laurels doing the same old crap, you're missing out and your competitors are going to do something else. So start experimenting because the value of something that works, that you find through just creative chaos is extremely higher than what you've already been doing because you start losing yields right away. Whatever your strategy is, and let's say you're getting a 2% response on it, watch, six months from now, it'll be 1.7 or 1.5. What's the next thing? What's the next idea? What's the next drop? What's new? Because it's so noisy out there, as you all know, you've got to keep creating. And everybody has the tools to do that. Obviously, the yields are way down from two years ago because of what Apple did on privacy, but that doesn't mean you can't fix it by smashing data together. If you're using Meta, you can buy other services that target your customers in various geographies. And we do that a lot. And I'm shamelessly promoting them, but I'm using C Squared Social in a lot of my companies now because they're small, they're entrepreneurial, and I'm a paid spokesperson. It's true. But it's because I eat my own cooking. I spend money on them to get my yields up on Meta, and I do. Let's say you've lost 28% of your yield because of Apple, which is approximately what you lost. You can get back half of that when you start smashing data from other sources, including yours. I mean, there's data out there that credit card companies and banks have 
that help you do this. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're screwed anyways. <laughs> so th this is a standard procedure right now in terms of putting together good campaigns. Oh, I love that. Well, I really agree with the experimenting um, points you're making. You know, we, we have a pop-up around the corner here for Meta. You should go and check it out. But we're showcasing um, a sunglasses company called Desi, which is a founder and creator owned. Um, they have beautiful products. The whole line has been built through Instagram and Facebook. And they sold 3,000 pairs of sunglasses in 48 hours through a campaign that they, um, you know, they tried through different formats on Reels and Instagram stories and so on. So I totally agree with the sentiment. You've got to keep experimenting to be one step ahead. And it's a little bit about the, what we talk about with our new company name, Meta, and the Metaverse. You know, that is a longer road out, but there are certainly ways that brands and businesses can start to experiment with AR filters and using 3D ads and starting to understand how consumers of the future are going to connect with brands in these new platforms and areas. So I'm going to put up a slide now and I'm going to have some audience participation. So what you can see here is about 14 different companies and um, the question for all of you is that you know, it's hard to imagine getting back to growth in a time like this, you know, in a time of economic downturn. And so the question for everyone is, how many of these companies do you think started in the recession? So I'll do a show of hands. Five? About five of them start in a recession? Eight? Well, oh, this is a tough crowd. Ten? There's 14, 10, okay. 14? Okay, there's only 14 on the slide. One? <laughs> All right, well, the answer is, we can do the reveal, all of them. And so the point here is, you know, Rustam said it really well, continue to innovate, continue to be, um, you know, experimental. Marketing should be ingenious and you should be taking these ideas through to the C-suite as much as you can. Um, so if we go to our next question, um, you know, we talked a little bit about um, creativity and how can you, you know, we talk about performance and CAC and data, but how can brands continue to be creative in this environment, and I'll ask you, Rustin, when you think about big ideas and everything that MasterCard has stood for over the years, yeah. what's the right balance there between brand versus performance? Sure. Look, as a payments company, our ambition or goal is to make payments as safe as possible and as frictionless as possible. And we're constantly innovating to do that. It starts with the consumer, and how do we make that consumer experience at the point of payment just that much better? And no one wakes up in the morning thinking, gee, how am I going to pay today? No, what you want to do is enjoy your life. You want to book that vacation. You want to buy a new pair of clothes. You want to buy a car. You want to make the payment moment as frictionless as possible. So everything we do with innovation is to try and make that happen. Now, as devices exponentially become uh, connected devices, the, the opportunity to build payments mechanisms into these devices just grows. So I see Kevin wearing a watch or a ring that, if it's a connected device, can become a payments device. You can simply uh, embed the payments technology in there, and you can tap on an on a, on a, uh, NFC code, and you can go from there. So that makes the, the, the payment moment frictionless. Now, what we saw during COVID is that a couple of things we were trying, like getting contactless cards more prevalent, getting e-commerce with card on file more prevalent. I mean, just the burst that we got out of COVID, because that became such an important consumer moment and such an important hygiene moment for consumers, not to have to touch devices, et cetera, in unfamiliar places, that our innovation of the last 10 years just blossomed in that environment. So we're already starting to think about how do we continue to make payments frictionless? So no matter what the environment, the consumer will gravitate towards safer, easier, faster ways to pay. That's so interesting. What are you seeing on the payment side of some of the businesses that you've supported or owned? I am using a use case. Uh, I teach a lot of graduating cohorts of engineers. Um, I always go to the graduating cohort because a third of the class is very entrepreneurial and they do deals and I get to see them before the VCs do them. So I'm doing this <laughs> on a selfish basis, but it, it really works. There's a use case I want to show you, and this is a shout out for Rustam. Um, here's a, payment systems are so brutally competitive in fintech, it's impossible. Well, let's, let, let's take a use case of a credit card. The chance that you could launch a credit card in this market, in my mind as an investor, zero probability of success because you'll never acquire customers. Here's one, built. This is a MasterCard. What this guy did, first time I ever invested, I own a piece of this company. He came to me and said, I'm going to use community. 
I'm going to go to every renter in America and let them pay their rent on a credit card. How crazy is that idea? Because I said, it'll never happen. You can't shave 3% out, out of a landlord. He said, no, the landlords pay nothing. We're going to make this work for the landlords and make our money on all the other things people do with this card. There he had a plan to go to a community and use social media to say, you pay rent? You want to increase your credit score? Use built. This thing is the fastest growing card in America. His CAC is low because if you rent, you want this. I knew it was going to work when my daughter and son called me and said, there's a waiting list. You've got to call the guy up. You're an owner. I need the card. <laughs> they were screaming to get their rent paid on it because it's two, three, four thousand a month that they're getting credit for. Brilliant, brilliant idea. That's using community. That's using social media. That's a payment system. But the key there is he figured out CAC. Everybody else that's trying to launch credit cards goes to zero almost immediately. They can't compete with MasterCard, American Express, Visa. It's impossible to gain share against those guys unless you're in bed with them and you have a different approach, which is what Bilt did. That's innovation. That's entrepreneurship. And boy, does that guy spend on social media. He's insane because he knows his CAC. He can pour gasoline on it. When I invested in it, it was a $5 million valuation. We just did another round of $1.5 billion. That was 18 months ago. That's what I'm talking about here. That's innovation in payments. Does everyone know Kevin's whole wallet is here? So if you've got an idea, <laughs> I just noticed that. <laughs> Let's meet us in the green room. Let's talk a little bit about community and then I'll wrap it up. But um, again, MasterCard does some tremendous uh, work across the community. And I love hearing these stories where business ideas are sort of born out of what the, com like where a brand or a company answers back. Tell us more about MasterCard and what you're doing there. Yeah, I'll give you a small example. Uh, you know, one of the things that, so this is the 25th anniversary of our priceless campaign. 25 years ago, we came up with this idea that there are some things in life money can't buy for everything else as MasterCard. And it's kind of been the, the, the philosophy on which the company has been built over the last 25 years. And we saw a community idea that came from actually one of our employees that has been a huge success. It's called the True Name Card. It's a card that allows you to put your chosen name on the card. Now, if you are a person who is, who is going through a, trans, a gender transition and are transgender, the worst thing possible is to put your credit card down at a shop or a restaurant and have the stigma of someone looking at the name and questioning whether that's really you. Mm. Now, the reality is we don't need the name to process a transaction. We just need the 16-digit code and the, and, and the security code. We don't need the name. So why is the name so important for the card at a point of payment? So we give people the option to put whatever, they, whatever name they want, whether it's because they're going through a gender transition or whether it's because they want to use uh, a maiden name or a professional name or any name that they might want. And this has just opened up such a host of possibilities for people that were otherwise stigmatized by a product feature that wasn't needed. So it's not technology innovation, but it is tactile, simple life innovation that has just made life that much better for a consumer. That is such a wonderful example. Similar to what, you know, we th when we think about avatars, and you know, we've been talking a lot about D to C, but think about D to A, which is gonna be direct to avatar, and what identities people can create in the future world where you can be whoever you wanna be and move across different platforms and express yourself in ways that matter most to you in that environment. And I just think this is, we're just at the start of this as marketers who really have to understand what the future of segmentation looks like in a world where you know you describe that we can be whoever we want to be and i'm super excited to to see where we go with that if you like that video wait till you see my next one don't forget to click right over here and subscribe